So a lot of folks, um, when they get to start doing the persuasive speech, they immediately say, okay, so wait, you made us do Monroe's motivated sequence for the, the, the last speech. Is there a requirement for a particular pattern for this speech? Well, in a way, yes. Um, but I'm not telling you which one. I'm giving you a variety of choices. All right. Um, and I'm going to go through those structures with you so that you can pick one that works really well for your argument. Um, the first thing I will say is a lot of people, they immediately start with, I'm just going to do statement of reasons. Here's the issue with statement of reasons, especially in a persuasive speech. Um, first of all, it's super easy to do a counter argument and it can be a real challenge to kind of narrow your field. Usually when I have a student going for statement of reasons, they have a tendency to struggle in unifying or getting the points cohesive. And since this has to be your best work, I really do need to see evidence of that cohesion or of that, um, that unity between the points. Now here's the thing, at the end of the day, reasons might be the best, best uh, organizational structure, but always leave that as your last resort and really think about why. And then if you do, I want you to think about how can I structure those reasons so that it makes sense to my audience why I've picked these three points, you know? Um, you know, for example, if we're trying to convince somebody that we should have um, free preschool, uh, you know, in addition to free elementary school for, for school children, you wouldn't say, you know, because it will help set them up for success, has uh, proven benefits at preventing problems down the road, and is cute to watch, um, you know, on YouTube or something like that. That's a really lame reason, but hopefully that makes sense. But you, you want to be careful because remember we talked about this in class. Those first two points are super easy to come up with, and then that last one has a tendency to often be out of unity. So think about how you would put those in order if you do have to use reasons. Hopefully you won't, all right? Um, comparative advantage, this is where you're comparing and contrasting the two, uh, two things. This is really good when you have um, a, a proposal that you want to change something that's currently in place. So if there is a thing that is currently the status quo, and you want to change it, then that's really good. Here's the, here's the rub. When you do comparative advantage, that third main point has to be a rebuttal. It has to be a, here are, you know, people's reasons for wanting to keep the status quo, and here is why my solution is better. That third main point is always the most challenging if you use comparative advantage. Really good example of a student who used this. I had a student who wanted to change how sentencing was done, for the possession of certain drugs. And that's because there was a really bad disparity between um, the sentencing for people who were, who, were, who were caught with crack possession versus cocaine possession. And there was a huge racial disparity. And um, so what she did is she laid out, here is, the, here is the current way we sentence, here is how I would like to see that sentence work and why, and here's research to back it up. Both of those pieces are going to have lots of research. And then at the end, th then they talked about here's why people who have put this in place in the first place were wrong. And so that's really important in comparative advantage. Um, criteria satisfaction is fun if you love puzzles and problems. Um, criteria satisfaction, what you do is you say, okay, this proposal that I'm putting out would be blank and then your reasons. Now why? what the blank is going to be your criteria. So like you're gonna say, this is going to be best for kids because, and then what you do is you set up each of your main points as a criteria for making something best for kids, all right? Um, and you say, okay, if doing what's best for kids is taking care of their mental well-being, their spiritual well-being, and their academic well-being, then I have to show how my, my proposal will fulfill all three of those criteria. It's really, it can be a very challenging format, but if you love debate and if you love, like, you know, kind of analyzing an argument for a lot of different sides, it can be a fun thing as long as you're really, really clear and unified. So keep that in mind. Um, refutive pattern, this is great if, if you are proposing something that is generally unpopular. So let's say you're trying to convince people that, um, 
for example, I'm trying to come up with a good example that, um, my brain just went blank, you know, that we should get rid of, um, oh, I know this, that the driving age should be raised to 18. All right. Probably generally unpopular, right? So you would have to take the objections that people have to doing that and then refute those or show why they're wrong. So for example, you might say, you know, um, executive fun function control doesn't really happen until someone is 21. So someone who's 16 doesn't have the judgment necessary to make good decisions, for example. I'm sure everybody who is younger than that, you're good drivers, I'm not saying that, but you know, that would be a, you know, that would be a refutive pattern example, all right? Um, problem solution refutation. In your book, um, it really talks about like problem cause solution, which I'm not a huge fan of. So it feels like you're going backwards, but problem solution rebuttal or refutation is a lot of fun and it's probably the easiest to do, all right? Um, problem solution refutation is where, especially when you've got a, a proposition of policy where you're trying to get somebody to do something. So like, let's say you say we should make, um, election day, a national holiday. I know I've used that before, but it's easy. Uh, we would talk about the problems that we have with, um, current voting levels and voter turnout. And then you would talk about your solution of turning that into a national holiday. And then your last main point would be answering the opposition or basically giving a rebuttal to people who would disagree with you. So those different structures, the cool thing about that is that they essentially write your speech for you. Um, and so I'm a big fan of picking one of these structures before you go further in the development of your persuasive speech. So hopefully that's helpful. See you in the next video.